Okay, good afternoon. My name is Christian Susan, and I think I'm sharing this uh, session, even though I'm also the first speaker. Um, so, uh, this session is about, is about high throughput screening, or high throughput um, calculations and data quality. And uh, the program will be, um, at, at first, there will be a, uh, a talk by myself about computation and screening uh, of light harvesting energy materials. And um, then there'll be a talk by Mikkel Strange on uh, estimating errors from high accuracy DFT calculations, so errors on DFT calculations. And then there will be a talk by Stein Duskov from uh, ETU Energy, which will introduce the genetic algorithm, which is a method for uh, global structure optimization. And uh, he will also introduce the hands-on tutorial, which will take place after these three talks, and which will be, be about genetic algorithm um, approach, where we try to use that method to calculate the convex hull of a surface alloy. Okay, so I think we should just get, get started. So, um, um, so I'm part of this uh, NOMAD uh, Center of Excellence that I'm sure you've heard already uh, something about. And um, the task of NOMAD is, is, is put up here. It is to uh, develop a materials encyclopedia and big data analytics and advanced graphics tools for material science and engineering. And uh, this, this project is building a, on top of a repository, the Nomad repository. Mm -hmm. And um, last year, um, myself and uh, my colleague, Carsten Jacobsen, wrote a perspective in science about computational um, screening of materials and, and big data approaches in material science. And we made this uh, new graph, which is showing the number of DFT calculations stored in the Nomad repository. And we were a little bit concerned about the flattening out. Over here, you can see in 2006, the number is sort of staying at uh, 3 million. But uh, um, you can see today, there is actually 44 million DFT calculations in the repository. So it's a huge repository that is growing at a, at a tremendous speed. So I think it's, uh, it's very appropriate to have uh, this school here on, uh, um, on how can we how can we use machine learning methods and how can we take advantage of all these, um, all the data that is stored in these databases. And um, of course one of the, uh, of the issues when, you, when you're going to use computational materials databases is the data quality. So can we trust the calculations that are in the repository, uh, which is produced by many different codes and using many different parameter settings and so on. And that will be the topic uh, of the next talk that, that Michael Strange will be talking about. Um, so I'd just like to mention that there are other mater uh, materials repositories around. Uh, we are developing one ourselves at, at DTU Physics called the Computational Materials Repository, which is uh, a, a much smaller scale kind of database where you're not um, able to upload from outside. So it's something we're using internally uh, for storing the results of, of our research projects. So we are uploading and organizing the data here, and then you can go and you can look uh, at the different projects there, and, and you can download all the data from the different projects. So it's a much smaller scale um, than the Nomad repository, a very different type of database. Okay, so the scientific case that I'll be uh, discussing today, and that I'll be using to illustrate the concept of materials uh, screening, computational materials screening, is that of uh, hydrogen production using solar energy. So there are basically two ways that you can convert solar energy into hydrogen. One is um, you use first the photovoltaics, solar cells, to convert the uh, solar photons into electrical energy. And then you do uh, some electrochemistry, uh, electrolysis, to convert the electrical energy into uh, uh, hydrogen by splitting water. So that's a process that has uh, or can have an efficiency of around 10%. The other possibility is to uh, cut out the middleman here and try to produce hydrogen directly. So this is called photoelectrocatalysis. So solar light is coming in, and one is directly producing hydrogen by splitting water. So that's a much more challenging process, and actually today uh, it's something that is not really uh, viable because we don't have the right materials at hand 
to um, analyze the reaction and to absorb the solar photons. Um, so I put a question mark in here because it's un unknown at present what the uh, what the efficiency of such a, a method is. But uh, let's try to take a look at at, at how this um, photoelectrochemistry uh, works or photoelectrocatalysis works. So solar light is coming in, uh, photons are absorbed in a, in a photoabsorber, and then that's converted into electrical pairs that then go to the surface here split water, so we have oxygen bubbling up on one side, and we have a, a, a proton going through a membrane, and over here we are reducing that H plus into hydrogen. So that's the basic principle. And we can break this down into three parts here. The first one is the photoabsorber, so we need to absorb the solar photons and convert them into electrical pairs. The next one is to produce uh, uh, the uh, protection layers here, because it turns out that such Photoabsorbers are not going to be stable under these conditions. They are uh, very likely to oxidize, so we need to protect them. So there is a problem of finding corrosion-resistant protection layers here to correct to protect the uh, uh, the uh, photoabsorber. And then we need catalysts. We need catalysts here for catalyzing the water splitting and the hydrogen evolution reactions. And what I'll be focusing on today is the photoabsorber problem. And uh, <clears throat> specifically, I'll be interested in this uh, tandem uh, device, where instead of having just a single semiconductor with a given band gap, we are combining two semiconductors, one with a large band gap that is absorbing high energy photons, and then there is a low band gap material here which is absorbing low energy photons. So we need two photons to create two electron hole pairs. Uh, but this electron here, if the potential uh, difference is correct, can move over and reduce this hole, and then we are left with one uh, highly energetic electron hole pair. And that's important because in order to drive the water splitting reaction, we need around two electron volts for that reaction. And if we just use a single photoabsorber, we need a band gap of at least two electron volts, and that means we can only harvest a, a relatively small fraction of the solar spectrum. Uh, so we can take a look at the uh, efficiency of such a device here plotted as a function of the top absorber band gap, so the large band gap material. And the blue curve here shows the efficiency as a function of band gap if we have a single photoabsorber material. And you can see that this peaks at around 7% here at a uh, band gap of around 2.3. If we combine a large band gap material with uh, silicon, which has uh, a perfect band gap for absorbing uh, uh, solar photons at the low band gap side here, which is with a band gap of around 1 eV, then you can see we can reach efficiencies of about 20%, and in that case we need a, a band gap material here, uh, a material with a band gap of around 1.8. So that's the challenge. The problem is that right now, as of today, there is no material that is efficient in creating uh, a two electron volt uh, or, or um, creating a, a two volt um, uh, photovoltage. Right? So we really need materials with band gaps around two electron volts in order to make such a tandem device. So if we look at materials that are uh, already known, we can see here they are uh, the conduction bands and the valence bands are plotted here relative to the um, redox potentials of the water splitting um, potential here, the hydrogen evolution potential, so we need the conduction band to be above this potential, we need the valence band to be below this potential here, if we are looking for a single material photoabsorber. We can see silicon here is, is actually quite uh, useful for, for a slow band gap material, it has a, a conduction band that is above the hydrogen evolution potential, so that would work um, for that hydrogen evolution reaction. Then over here, we have all the oxides, and you can see the band gaps are generally too large, and the valence bands are lying too deep. But then we have the sulfides here, and they actually have valence bands, they have smaller band gaps closer to the 1.8, and they have valence bands that are actually closer to the um, oxygen evolution potential down here. So looking at sulfides is probably a, a, a good strategy. And um, so with that in mind, we looked for uh, sulfide perovskites in the stoichiometry of ABS3. And if you just take the periodic uh, table and you say how many combinations, how many materials can we make if we let A and B be any metals in the periodic system here, then it's around 3,000 uh, combinations that we can find. 
Okay, so if you just take at random two metal atoms and put them together with three sulfurs, then um, um, most likely you will viol violate the, um, the valence rule here, and uh, that material that violates the valence rule is not going to be stable. Okay, so if we also um, incorporate the valence rule here, so we say that the oxidation states of the A and the B atom have to sum up to six, because sulfur will usually take um, two electrons, and we have three of them, so they have to sum up to, to six here, then we are down to 705 compounds that satisfy this rule here. Um, so now we're doing a computational screening, and the computational screening is, is illustrated by this uh, screening funnel here. So if you start, uh, you have a number of criteria that you want to, uh, to evaluate. One is uh, stability, another is band gap. Effective masses could be another uh, quantity of interest because you want to have low effective masses in order to have high mobilities. The electrons and holes that are created have to reach the surface of the material, and you want the material to be defect tolerant. These, uh, this can be calculated, all of these properties, using DFT, but some of them are much more computational demanding than others. So it makes sense to apply this screening strategy where we start with the simplest criteria, and the materials that do not fulfill this criteria are then um, excluded up here. And then as we go down the funnel, we have fewer and fewer material candidates, and we, sub and, and we evaluate um, properties and functionalities that require more and more expensive calculations. So that's the idea behind this computational screening approach. Um, so since we are interested in semiconductors, we started out with the 700 um, uh, candidates here, and then we did DFT calculations of the band gap, and I should say that all these calculations are done with the GPO electronic structure code, which is a PAW plane wave code. Um, it's an open source project, and you can download um, uh, that code freely under GPL license. Um, right, so what I wanted to say is that we start off with cubic perovskite structure, and then we calculate band gap. But the band gap is very sensitive to the structure. And it turns out that if we take the 700 um, perovskite in the cubic structure and we calculate how many of those have a band gap, we find that only 25 have a band gap. So most of them are exalic. That might seem surprising. And uh, indeed, after letting the structure here relax into a distorted cubic structure, then 200 of the structures actually have a band gap. So this shows this uh, extreme sensitivity of the band gap or the band structure in general to the structure of the material. So relaxation, and in particular, if the system wants to undergo symmetry um, breaking distortions, that could uh, influence the band gap of the band structure um, quite dramatically. Okay, so out of the 700 compounds, when we do this uh, simple uh, distorted uh, cubic perovskite, around 200 of them have a band gap. Okay, so we throw out all the materials now that do not have a band gap in the distorted perovskite structure. So we're left with 200 um, stoichiometries. Then we go to the ICSD, and if we search for structures with a ABS3 um, chemical formula, we find uh, 225 structures in this inorganic crystal structure database. These are all experimental uh, crystal structures, and they come in 28 different structures. So out of the 28, we pick the six most frequently occurring structures, and then those are the structures, together with the distorted perovskites, that we're considering for the remaining part of our screening procedure. So we have now roughly 200 times seven different uh, compounds to look at. Okay, so now we did the uh, check for semiconducting structures. We uh, decided on which structures to use um, for the screening. And the next step is the stability. So um, the thermodynamic stability of a material is estimated using the convex hull, and you can see the formula up here for calculating the convex hull. So what you do is you're looking at all the possible uh, for a given stoichiometry, A, X, B, Y, just to take a binary example, you look for all the possible phases you have which contain A and B atoms in some stoichiometry. And then you form linear combinations of these phases uh, with expansion coefficients that have to be positive and have to obey the, uh, the conditions here so that they in total have the same stoichiometry that you're interested in. Okay? 
So this will tell you if your material now has an energy above this convex hull, it means that it's energetically more favorable for the machine to segregate into these different phases up here. So you will end up with the same phase segregated uh, uh, compound. Okay? So thermodynamic stability at a given stoichiometry is then guaranteed if the material is lying on the convex hull. So all the dots up here are above the convex hull. In this case, this is aluminum oxide as a function of the uh, amount of, of aluminum in here. So all the, all the phases up here will be thermodynamically unstable. Okay, so for all the compounds that we have at present, we calculated the convex hull, and we did that by taking the OQD database, which is a database um, that has vast calculations for, uh, I can't remember how many thousand um, compounds. So there are a lot of binaries, and there are also quite a lot of ternaries, and a lot of ternaries also from the ICSD database. So we simply took all the materials from that database, and we calculated the convex hull for our ABS3 structures. And then we evaluated the energy of the seven phases, that we, the seven structures that we are interested in, and compared it to each other, and compared them to the convex hull. And here you can see the result for just a, a few of the ABS3 compounds, for example, over here, you can see that the black symbol, uh, that's the hull energy, that's the convex hull, and you can see in this case that all the seven structures we're looking at here have an energy that is higher than the convex hull. So in this case, we will discard niobium copper sulfide and not work anymore with that material because the convex hull is actually, or all the, the structures we're looking at are thermodynamically unstable. Okay. But if we look over here, you can see there is one, two, three, four, five of the structures we're looking at, and all of them are more stable than the convex hull. Okay? The convex hull, of course, uh, the real convex hull would then include the most stable of these structures in reality. But this is what we're looking at here is an approximation to the real convex hull, which is produced by the materials that happen to be in the OQP database. And clearly, that didn't include the materials that we're looking at here. Okay, so in this case, we will, we will keep all these materials here. You can see there is an error bar on the DFT calculations, and uh, Nickel will talk more about how to make this error bar on the DFT calculations, but I just want to say that these calculations are done with the uh, so-called beef functionals, and the beef functional works with an ensemble of enhancement factors for GTA functionals, and the width of that ensemble of enhancement factors has been determined by comparing the result of DFT calculations to experiments. Right, to known experimental structures. So this error bar here says something about the error coming from the, from the GTA approximation. Okay. Um, so there are a couple of things to note here in general that uh, typically there are many structures that have very similar energies. Uh, we should also bear in mind that when we're looking at these materials at finite temperatures, there are entropic effects that will really change the energetic ordering of the different phases. Um, so what we do is we decide to keep structures that are within 25 mV per atom of the most stable phase. Okay? So that means that uh, in these cases here, we will probably include, um, uh, let me see, a couple. Over here, we will only include one material because there is one material that is uh, more stable than the rest of the materials by at least 25 mV. Okay? So that's the um, way we decide on, on stable structures. Okay, so now we have a number of, of, of stable materials. Um, and uh, next step is to consider the band gap of these materials. And as you might know, uh, then DFT with some of the most widely used exchange correlation functionals is not very good at predicting band gaps. But we have um, um, found that using this uh, GLESC functional, which is not a very well-known exchange correlation functional, um, then we can actually get uh, quite good agreement, you can see over here, between the calculated band gaps um, from theory and those from experiments. This is now tested for a, a range of metal oxides. Um, the crucial thing with this exchange correlation functional here compared to other exchange correlation functionals is that this functional actually allows you to estimate what is known as the derivative discontinuity. 
And there is a fundamental theorem that says that the true quasi-particle band gap of a material is the cone sham band gap, which is in general not the correct band gap, but the cone sham band gap plus what is known as the derivative discontinuity. And typically, the de derivative discontinuity is either predicted to be zero, that's the case with all the similar local functionals, or the functional doesn't prescribe how to calculate the derivative discontinuity. So that's the difference um, uh, of that functional from other functionals. And you can see that um, this is another test where we looked at 20 randomly chosen systems from the ICSD and calculated band gaps with a range of different methods, as you can see up here, and the mean absolute error um, of all these methods compared to fully self-consistent uh, GW calculations is shown over here. You can see the CLLBSC, which is really not much more expensive than a GTA calculation, is within 0.4 EV of the GW result, which is not perfect agreement, but it's acceptable for a screening study. So using that functional, we are now calculating the band gap of all the materials that, that are left in this screening study. And you can see again here um, the different phases, the different structures we're interested in. And this is just a subset of the materials that we have at this point of the screening. And um, we have the band gaps here of the most stable structures. There might be more than one structure if they are within 25 millibar um, uh, instability, then we have more structures with the same stoichiometry. So for example, here is silver tantalum sulfide. You can see there is only one material here. Um, in this structure up here, you can see that has a band gap of, of 0.7. So that's something that could be interesting for photovoltaics with a single uh, semiconductor absorber. So we keep that. So the blue uh, window down here are materials that would be interesting for single crystal photovoltaics, and the green up here is large band gap materials for tandem cells. Okay, it's our, it's our main interest. So you can see there are cases here that are that are a little bit problematic um, because there are three stable structures here, and they actually have three different, quite different band gaps. Okay, so what to do in this case? That's a that's a difficult case. There are other cases, for example, here where there is only one structure here with one band gap. So there we are more sure about what, what we could expect. But anyway, these are all the band gaps that we calculate. And um, next step is now to consider effective masses. And the effective mass is defined as the, essentially the second derivative of the, um, of the band structure energy with respect to the wave vector k at the bottom of the conduction band or the top of the valence band. And that's interesting, the effective mass, because it's directly related to the mobility and you want to have high mobilities because you want the charges to reach the surface to do uh, the chemistry, um, or to collect the charges if you're interested in photovoltaics. Uh, so you can see there is another parameter up here, which is the relaxation time of the material. This is a parameter that is very hard to calculate from first principles. It depends on how many impurities do you have in the material. It depends on electrophone uncoupling, and so on. So this is something we will have to assume is the same for all the materials, and then we will use the effective mass as a descriptor for how high the mobility is. And what we choose in the screening is to take only the materials that have effective masses for both electrons and holes that are less, that are lower than one. Okay, so that's a criteria we set. So all these materials in here represent uh, hopefully high mobility semiconductors. Okay, the final thing we have here in the screening funnel is uh, what I call defect tolerance. So, uh, in reality, defects play a very important role, uh, probably a much more important role than we would like to, uh, to, uh, to believe as theoreticians, because defects are, are difficult to treat. In DFT calculations, they require large supercells, and therefore typically, at least in these high throughput screening studies, defects are typically not taken into account. Uh, however, they are really important. Here you can see an illustration, uh, just a cartoon of what happens if you photo excite carriers. So very quickly, uh, these carriers will be relaxed in the conduction band and the valence band to form some quasi-equilibrium uh, uh, distribution. But then after a few picoseconds, those electrons and holes will start to recombine non-radiatively through defect states in the band gap. So if we have states that sit in the band gap, they will act as scattering sensors and therefore reduce the transport properties of the, of the material, and they will act as recombination sensors, 
where we will basically lose the electric ball pairs that we've generated by the solar photons. So, ideally, we would like to have materials that are robust against the formation of states inside the band gap. And this is what we call defect tolerant semiconductors. Okay? So what we did is we took all of the materials that we have left at this point of our screening, and we simply created sulfur vacancies and vacancies of the A and the B metal atoms, and then we calculated the uh, band structure and looked for states inside the band gap. And you can, you can see here, for barium zirconium, there is a case where uh, for all the different defects, we still have our electronic structure of the pristine system present, so there are no uh, localized states in the band gap, whereas for this case over here, you can see the formation of localized states in the gap. So this is really a killer for optoelectronic applications of this material, and we exclude all the materials that, forms the, uh, that form uh, uh, deep mid-gap states at this level of the screen. Okay, so at this point, we're actually through with our screening funnel, and we have a list here of around 20 uh, candidates. Um, you can see here the calculated band gap with the GLLB functional. Um, this is the direct band gap, so if the numbers are the same, we have a direct band gap of the material. This is the HSE band gap, as you can see over here for comparison. These are the effective masses, and this is the structure prototype uh, that came out. Some of the materials up here are highlighted in bold. That's the material where there is only one structure that is significantly more stable than all the others. Okay? So that's where we're really sure, or we are most sure, that this is the structure that will actually come out if we try to synthesize uh, bismuth lithium sulfide. In, in the other cases, there is at least one other structure that is within 25 mEV per atom, as stable as this material here, and which might then have a different band gap. Okay? So we showed this list to some of our experimental colleagues. They looked at it and they said, vitriol lanthanum sulfide, that sounds interesting. We could probably make that. And they went to the lab and they managed to synthesize that material. And uh, using XRD, they confirmed that the structure they obtained was actually the one we had predicted. And they confirmed that the band gap from absorption spectrum here was two electron volts. And they also confirmed uh, from the very strong photoluminescence peak here at close to 2 EV, that this was a direct band gap material as predicted, and that defects were playing a minor role. Because if you have too many defects here and you have states inside the band gap, then the photoluminescence peak will be uh, dramatically lower. So the intensity of this photoluminescence peak here strongly suggests that it's, uh, it's close to being a pristine semiconductor. There might be defects, but they don't introduce localized states in the gap. Okay, so let me conclude here. Um, so what I showed you was uh, an example of a computational screening study where we looked at, um, to begin with, around 3,000 um, peroxide sulfides. We managed to reduce that to 20 candidates based on the stability of the, of the uh, compound, and we looked at eight different structures that we uh, were inspired to pick based on the um, frequency of occurrence of these types of sulfides uh, in the ICSD database. We looked at band gaps, effective masses, and defect tolerance. Um, the lanthanum yttrium uh, sulfide was then successfully synthesized, and what we're doing now, or the experimentalists are doing now, is looking at integrating this material with the silicon uh, low band gap photoabsorber with the aim of using that as a, as a tandem solar cell, or perhaps even for um, two photon um, water splitting. So, is this a success? Well, I think that just the fact that the experimentalists managed to make this material and confirm our theoretical prediction can be viewed as a success. Whether it's a real success, uh, I think depends on whether this will eventually make it into a device that can do um, uh, photovoltaics or, or um, hydrogen production um, at high efficiency. And this is still to be um, answered. Uh, so finally, let me say um, uh, a couple of things that characterizes computational uh, screening studies. So um, I think first of all, this is simple. You don't need fancy machine learning algorithms. Um, it's really just a matter of, of sitting down and figuring out what are the um, key properties that you would like this material to fulfill in order to hopefully be good at the um, final 
functionality that you're interested in. Uh, so it's characterized by uh, that there is a number of properties that you can evaluate, and typically they have um, different demands computationally. So stability is simple, but defect calculations are hard, so it makes sense to apply this, this, this screening approach where you start with the simplest thing to calculate, and then you narrow down your set of, of potential candidates. Um, so you only evaluate the hard stuff for a much smaller group of materials. Okay, so one of the challenges in doing this is the structure. We have done plenty of other screening studies before this one where we just fixed the structure and then did combinatorial screening. This is very easy. You just take the periodic system, you replace atoms, and you have a fixed structure. That's easy to implement. The problem is you very often end up with structures that are really not the most uh, stable um, type of, of that material. So here we looked at just uh, eight different structures, and that's of course an improvement uh, with respect to just considering a, simple stru uh, a single structure. But what will be um, um, another approach here, which is a more elegant approach, and a more um, you know, clever approach, is uh, the genetic algorithm. And uh, Sting will talk about that, um, not in the next talk, but afterwards. And uh, this is also what the, uh, the hands-on tutorial is about today. So genetic, genetic algorithms for structure uh, optimization. And with that, I would just like to thank my collaborators here uh, from KV theory people and also our experimental collaborators. And uh, thank you for the attention.